shut up and sit down. So next up, we'd like to welcome Bob Berninga, WB4APR. The title of his talk is The Threat of High Voltage Switching, Solar and EVs to Amateur Communications. Thank you. And you'll notice that that's not on the slide because everything I'm going to be talking about is in the uh, ARRL book here on, on energy and power uh, that they started uh, uh, distributing in uh, August. Also, um, excuse me, in uh, May, and uh, an article I wrote in May um, on you know, uh, establishing your own microgrid. And the whole reason for this is, although nothing's changed, including all the gray beards in this room, um, underneath the energy is totally changing. And first of all, is because now we have universal power supplies where everything runs on 100 to 240 volts AC. They will also run on uh, 100 to 330 volts DC, just as is. Just plug it into DC, it'll work. Uh, we have LED, LED lighting everywhere, which are nice little RFI generators. We have solar power is now cheaper than coal, and yet they're up on the roof of the house where they can be uh, uh, antenna radiators. Hybrids, every hybrid car has a 50,000 watt generator built into it. Talk about a ham's uh, dream. Uh, EVs uh, are now better, faster, cleaner, quieter, safer, cheaper to buy, cheaper to operate, and cheaper to maintain than gas cars. Um, and then we have people talking about the whole house uh, battery backup, such as the Tesla Powerwall, and what's in common? A high voltage DC switching. Um, energy is a lot more than just a hobby. Uh, this is some of the background starting in 19... Uh, 65, when I wound my first generator, got my first electric car in 83, built, uh, was, well, back up. Uh, my senior project at Georgia Tech was to build a, a, an electric car for the clean air car race from um, uh, MIT to Caltech, and we made it as far as the Mississippi. Anyway, and here's where I am now. I mean, and you've, heard, you've seen my Priuses, and uh, now I'm driving a Volt. And so uh, emergency power is... Uh, emergency ham radio operation is uh, emergency power, and so you don't go to field day without it. Um, but if you want some serious portable power, think uh, an electric car. Um, a serious uh, contender there is the Leaf. You can buy a used Leaf, three years old off Leaf, uh, off, off lease, um, for only about nine thousand dollars, and that's equivalent to bringing uh, forty uh, batteries to uh, field day, and. For $9,000, buy this, you get to drive it every day, plus it has the same energy as a Tesla Powerwall, costing um, three times as much. Or you can buy a, a plug-in hybrid that uh, is, uh, the generating capability of this car is the same as a uh, 50kW generator. Uh, the Chrysler minivan, for example, also, I mean, there's 40 uh, hybrid uh, plug-ins on the market. So this slide, I put a gold band around it because it, uh, solar power and electric cars are the perfect marriage because just nine solar panels can fully charge a, a, a Prius plug-in, a Pacific a minimum band, for example, every day forever, totally independent of gas, oil, and everything else. All this news about the Middle East doesn't phase me in the least. Doesn't, uh, nothing changes for me. All my energy uh, for driving comes from the sun. So it's a whole new world of power. Um, power systems nowadays with modern power supplies are 10% uh, the size and volume that they used to be, and the reason is, is because the first thing you do with the AC power is you full wave rectify it uh, to high voltage DC, and then the switching electronics, and you, uh, that's the output of every modern uh, switching power supply. Um, and so, kind of, uh, oh, and, and since, uh, the actual input to the DC switching power supply is 330 volts uh, DC. Uh, data centers and other places now that have a whole lot of things that they have to run, it's far more efficient to uh, distribute the power at 330 volts DC. Remember, you can just still pl just plug this thing in to a 330 volt DC line and it still just works. So distribute 330 volts DC throughout your facility, plug in all your switching supplies there, and you've just eliminated 75% of the distribution losses because, you know, the I squared R losses, when you triple the voltage, I, I, triple the voltage, I squared, um, goes down by a factor of 10. Um, so here's a good example of how I use this in ham radio. This is the annual uh, Golden Packet event where we 
try to uh, exchange APRS messages from Georgia to Maine along the Appalachian Trail. We have 15 uh, uh, stations, and so my station is on top of this tower, 100-foot uh, observation tower that I, you got to climb vertically. And um, where am I going to get power up there? The first time I said solar, and of course it was cloudy and rainy all day, so I said not doing that again. Um, so. I, I said, I'll just run the power from the parking lot down here, the 3,200 feet up to the top of the tower. And I can do that in, in something about the size of a laptop carrying case. Uh, look carefully. This is just the typical 140-watt power supply you plug into your cigarette lighter. Then you go into a box, which is a, a voltage uh, doubler, two capacitors, two diodes. Got 330 volts DC on the line, 3,200 feet of wire, fits in a laptop carrying uh, case. Binding posts, connect to the ground pins, and then plug in your um, uh, laptop power supply. And so uh, here it is, 12 volts, doubler inverter, 330 volts DC, and then back down. Oh, and of course, nothing special about what you plug in. Any modern uh, switching uh, supply can just plug into the 330 volts DC directly. Uh, don't trust me. Test before you. Okay. Um, so, so here's the, imp the important thing to remember about single wire earth return, uh, which is not legal in the United States, is that the earth, <laughs> the earth resistance does not change. If you drive a 10-foot, uh, or a, this is meter, so a 30-foot ground rod, the resistance in, uh, around here in the back east is 10 ohms, and it's 10 ohms whether you're going to the other side of your yard or 100 kilometers. Because the farther you go, the more earth that's involved, and so the resistance is basically the same. So after you go a couple of hundred feet, the, uh, it's not the ground resistance, it's the wire resistance that makes the difference. Um, and so there I am at the top operating for six hours, and it all comes up this little wire right here. <laughs> um, yeah, don't touch the wire. <laughs> um, so it's all about emergency power, and uh, you know, we used to dream of having a 10 kW generator in our backyard. Um, at huge cost or a, ba a bank of batteries and all of that to provide one dollar's worth of electricity during a um, four-hour power outage, which is the average in Maryland. How much are you willing to invest for one dollar's worth of electricity? It's amazing what people will do. Uh, where every hybrid has all these gears and stuff and a petrol engine, but they all have a, a 12 volt down converter down to the 12 volt battery and you can draw a kilowatt to 2 kW out of that through any kind of standard $150 inverter, power your refrigerator and all the lights in the house. So uh, for 10 years now, I've been driving around with, you know, uh, I, I, I've got uh, 220 volts DC, which is the battery voltage of the um, Prius, plug in anything there up to about 10 kW, or uh, go through an inverter in the trunk. Uh, there's a picture of my inverter. And that, what is that, a $99 inverter, and it'll power a chainsaw, uh, even a small um, air conditioner. And, you know, having that in the back of your trunk, every ham should do that, just as a, a, a matter of uh, emergency response. If you're really lucky and you can find a, a high-voltage, uh, uninterruptible power supply, UPS, buy it, because uh, that is what we need. And there is no commercial product because there is no commercial demand. Um, I just found out that in my Chevy Volt, that 12-volt down converter is 2kW. So you could draw continuous 2kW out of the 12-volt battery. Of course, you can draw 4, 6kW for instantaneous because, you know, uh, anything more than the 2kW will come from the battery for a few minutes. Um, so, uh, uh, years ago, I came up with how do I want to distribute this to the whole um, uh, field day site, and I came up with just a standard two-prong plug because if you go to Home Depot and you try to use any commercially available plug, you're violating the rules because you're trying to use it for something that plug was not rated for or designed for. Um, or, and, or somebody's going to come along and try to plug something else into it, or, so you're, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So I wanted to have a unique plug, but this still only cost 89 cents. And so what I came up with was just take a standard outlet, drill a hole in it, put a little wooden peg in there, and now that is a universal uh, plug-in. You can plug in uh, anything uh, that you have already determined will plug in by drilling a hole in the other 89 cent connector, and now you have matching things. <laughs> um, I tried to publish this uh, years and years ago in QST, and they said, no way, we don't do anything uh, with any voltages over 12 volts because it's too dangerous. 
How many of you were Cub Scouts back in the 1960s and built the two-tube uh, radio as a standard requirement for a Cub Scout? 150 volts DC. All right, so, uh, well, why can't you do this with your gas car? Just, just, put in, whoops, just put in an inverter and power it. Well, because a 60 amp alternator only provides about 30 amps at idle or only about 400 watts average. Plus, your car is running all the time at idle and the most you can get out of it is about 400 watts. Um, so that's why I talk about you know, uh, EVs and hybrids. And the first thought is, well, uh, EVs are, when the grid goes down, you got nothing. No, you don't have to go stand in line to try to get gas because you can either recharge your car from your solar panels or you can drive over across the street to a guy who does have lights and plug in your car and charge uh, there. So EVs are the ideal thing to have during a power outage. A good example is the uh, Sandy blackout. This is a satellite view before, this is a satellite after, but you still see about half the lights are still on uh, and they're still widely distributed. So if you've got an EV, just go plug into somebody who has the lights on uh, to recharge. So uh, EVs are now, as I said before, better, cleaner, faster, quieter, safer, cheaper to buy, cheaper to operate, and cheaper to maintain than the average gas car. There's over 47 of them on the market. I started getting involved in 2007 before there were any on the market. And so uh, back then you could buy uh, salvage Priuses pretty cheap and uh, do a, uh, whatever conversion you wanted to do. So most of what people think they know about EVs is wrong or 10 years out of date. And uh, the whole uh, thing about EVs is 95% of our driving is local. Um, and so there's the 47 cars on the market and uh, half, a, half of them now have ranges over 350 miles. And yet you talk to people and they say they don't have enough range. Half of them cost less than the average gas car. Um, what is that? Yeah, down to as low as 20,000 for a, has 630 mile gas range, 29 miles electric range for only $20,000. Uh, and yet people say uh, EVs cost too much. Um, the thing about don't, don't buy another gas car until you have at least looked at an electric vehicle because gas cars stay on the road for 18 to 20 years before they're finally scrapped. And imagine that that thing is going to be out there spewing those toxic emissions for the next 20 years, well through 2035. Um, uh, so make sure you look at whether there's an EV for you. These are all the uh, electric, pure battery electric, and notice that 80% of them cost less than the average gas car. These are the plug-in hybrids, and 45% cost less than the average gas car. Uh, and finally, in 2020, the uh, electric truck is starting to arrive. The Rivian workhorse is said to come out next year. Uh, Ford, Chevy, and Tesla are all uh, racing to be the first one out with the electric truck because that is the ideal thing to, to be electric because uh, you've got absolute maximum torque and you've got 50,000 watt generator built in and you've got batteries to run for a week and it's just uh, it's great. So why is everything going electric is because there's only one moving part. And uh, a battery is not a tank. People are so used to pulling into a gas station and, oh, they love that experience. I mean, it's the ideal uh, uh, experience of convenience, and you only have to do it about once a week. But for an EV, they're, they're, you don't even think about charging. It's, it's uh, because you drive it when you're driving it. When you park it, you plug it in. Every time you get in that car, it is full. Okay? So... Um, our legacy experience is when we see somebody pull up to a gas pump, we think that's a $30 to $50 transaction. Not realizing that when somebody plugs into your electric outlet just to top up their car, it's only 20 cents an hour uh, from the electric grid. And every single electric car comes with a standard 120 volt uh, uh, plug. So you don't need no stinking um, uh, fancy charger. Why do you see so much emphasis on, uh, on electric vehicle charging station? Because it's something that a third party can sell you. All right? Remember what President Bush says. 60% of the American economy is based on us buying and selling things we don't need. Okay, public charging is one of those things. Um, because uh, you, you charge at home and at the workplace. This tip of the iceberg that everybody is so focused on is only le it's, it's, it's less than 1% of the actual need. 
because electric cars, you don't drive on trips. You drive them locally, you come in, plug them in. And this, show, this is a GM slide, shows green is all the time that the car is parked at home out of the 24 hours of the day. Red is while it's parked at work. Uh, blue is while you're parked at you know, Walmart or whatever. And this top blue up here is when you're actually driving the car. If you're driving a gas car, that's when you've got to worry about refueling. Where's the next gas station? I've got to fill up. I'm late and everything else. That's why you, people are so focused on time to charge because it's the most inconvenient way for transportation. Whereas the EV just plugs in while it's parked and it's always full every time it gets in it. So uh, public charging is, is, is like a, a spare gas can. It's just some, something uh, when you are stupid enough to uh, exceed what you've got in the tank or in the battery. Um, every outdoor outlet, every, every place that I find one, I knock on the owner's door and say, please put up a sign. You've got a complete electric vehicle charging station right there. Why don't you make it available to your friends and customers? The charging load on 120 volts is simply the same as a coffee pot. You hear people say, well, the grid can't handle it, it's going to blah, blah. No, if, if the grid can't handle a coffee pot, then we've got a problem. Uh, now, here's what you get if you're able to plug in at work. This is just, you know, standard garage. If you can find one of these things, plug in, and now all of a sudden you double your range. But when you double your range, you quadruple uh, the total area. So uh, just with a 40-mile volt... I can only go like 20 miles to work uh, on 100% electricity, but if I'm able to plug in when I get there, then all of a sudden I can do Washington, Annapolis, and Baltimore, and anywhere in between. This is my own personal, I'm trying to go real fast. This is a normal hour and a half talk I'm trying to do in 30 minutes. So this is my own personal energy thing, and started in 2007 when I found I could buy these uh, cheap uh, junkyard Priuses, uh, and then the second Prius, then I got put up my first solar then you just simply call up the utility and say, uh, switch all my power to wind. And so that way, um, all these people that says, but you're driving on coal. Not me. I'm driving on wind power. Then find the biggie was getting rid of the 1,000 gallons of fuel oil every um, year and going to geothermal heat pump, adding more solar. And so my total energy use is actually half of what it used to be. Um, but all of that is uh, coming from the sun and the total cost is about $8 a month because you still got to stay plugged into the grid, and that's the minimum uh, charge in Maryland to, uh, to have, grid, have the grid. Uh, this puts it in dollars. If you add up all of those uh, things, I used to be paying $6,000 a year in all of my energy. I'm down now to only $300 a year, uh, which is the $8 a month to the uh, uh, utility, and the fact that my uh, wife has to drive down to uh, grandma every now and then, and so you got to put uh, some gas in the uh, uh, plug-in tank. Uh, so my solar awakening began in 2010 when I put up, put up my first uh, array, and I was so wrong, and that's why I want get, to get this out there. As a ham radio operator, I thought I had to have a basement full of batteries. I dreamed of having a basement full of batteries. I collected batteries. I have a basement full of batteries, and I've never used them. Um, because solar, modern solar has nothing to do with batteries. It's just that every watt you produce, you either use it or push it back into the grid and get full retail credit for it so that when you need it later, you get it back for free. Um, and the cost of solar is just tanked. They were predicting that uh, um, uh, solar would be cheaper than coal by uh, 2020. Uh, and it's, in, I don't know what I did here, but anyhow, uh, it's been three or four years ahead of what even the predictions. Uh, uh, solar is now, was cheaper than coal starting in 2015. It's now so cheap that even Saudi Arabia is uh, fully invested in it. Uh, my first array, um, when I got in about 2010, that would have been $9,000. Now it's uh, $1,500. Um, what is grid tie? It's simply taking a bunch of solar panels, hooking them in series, going into an inverter, and then taking line one, line two neutral. You have to have a switch on the outside of your house and then coming back into a 20 amp breaker. That's it. Um, and then you just, when the sun is shining, you watch the meter go backwards. When the sun goes down, you watch the meter go forwards. Now, everybody says, oh, I want to go off grid. You're crazy. If you have access to the grid, you do not want to go off grid because you will spend three times as much for the same amount of power because you'll be operating at 48 volts. You'll have this massive expense of batteries that you have to maintain for the rest of your life. And your copper wires have to be, let's see, going from 48 volts to 480 volts. The copper investment is 100 times more copper. You've got to have conductors as big around as your 
finger as opposed to just standard number 14 house wire. Um, just don't, don't even think about it. Well, what about the value of a home battery? They are coming, absolutely, because remember, energy storage is the most important thing about renewable energy, but it makes no sense today. And here's why it, it, it I mean, it makes sense today, but the public utilities, the politicians, and everybody else do not give you access to that benefit. Here, this is called the duck's back uh, curve. And it shows that uh, the, the typical 24-hour day and how it used to be that the peak was during the day. By 2012, there was so much uh, solar in California that uh, the peak was about here. By 2013 now, there was no peak during the day. Oh, by the way, this is, this is not every day. This is on in, a, in, in a, a spring or fall, before heating, after he air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Just kind of a nice average day. Uh, and by 2013, there, were, there is no longer a peak during uh, the sun uh, during the day. But of course, the utilities still charge you peak rates during the day, right? Because they, they don't change. Very now we're down here where the, uh, the cheapest electricity is during the day. In fact, the electricity is so cheap here that it goes negative from about, uh, on this particular day, uh, from about uh, uh, 7 a.m. Uh, to 3 p.m., the cost of electricity wholesale is negative, which means the utilities are paying people to take this energy. All right? But here's the problem. What happens then uh, between uh, 4 p.m. and uh, 8 p.m. when you have to ramp up the entire grid to start feeding in that energy that, uh, that people have saved? And the, the, so that's the real game in town. But look what the utilities are paying going from negative, but let's just say on average they pay about one cents a kilowatt hour, um, and it goes up to five cents a kilowatt hour during those two hours. Now you've got a five to one money-making proposition. If they would just, instead of buying it from fossil fuel ramped up coal and gas generators to meet that two hour demand, if they would pay you five times what you're currently paying for electricity to draw it out of your battery, that's where we're going, and that's where a battery will pay for itself in only two years. Um, economically, it pays for itself in two years, and you have a whole house backup battery for the rest of your life. All right, so that's uh, kind of what I'm talking about here. So it used to be that we would say that uh, grid solar power is, uh, is not emergency power. Grid solar power is economical power. It's 99.95% .95 of the time. Um, oh, and going back... So people say, well, what do I do when the sun goes down? What do you do now? What, excuse me, what do, I do, what do you do when the grid goes down? You do exactly the same thing you do now. Going to economical solar power to get energy cheaper has nothing to do with what do you do when the grid goes down. You buy a $200 generator and a $15 can of gas. You don't go out and spend $15,000 for a whole house backup for $1 worth of electricity. Okay, um, but the good news is that finally the grid tie uh, inverter manufacturers are starting, uh, at least Sunny Boy provides this uh, grid down secure power outlet. So even when the grid goes down, they'll still give you 15 amp uh, outlet and 15 amps you can do quite a bit. Uh, you can charge your electric car, for example. All right, so now uh, solar power is not only economical power, but it can also provide an emergency power. Um, you can power your whole house from your electric car for a week or your hybrid, but the, it's currently available only in Japan. I mean, I mean, you know, with Fukushima, Japan is really sensitive to people being able to uh, store and use their own power. Um, and the advantage that, see, what I showed you before was just hooking up a, a one or two kW thing to your 12 volt uh, uh, car system. But if you, ha if you actually uh, have the Leaf to home or Prius to home, uh, you can draw 6 kilovolt uh, uh, or 6 kW instantaneously. But anybody with a plug-in hybrid or EV, just, just a little, uh, what is that, $40 cigarette lighter thing will now pow power 20 LED bulbs in your house. And if you can get the kids to turn off the lights they're not using, uh, that's all you need during a power outage, plugged into a cigarette lighter. If you need more power, clip onto the 12-volt battery, and there's plenty of energy for you. And remember, universal power supplies, everything runs on 330 volts DC. So let's look back at your solar system. You have all these, is that my warning? 
No, okay. Um, you have all of these 30 volt uh, uh, things in series, and it gives you up around 400, 500, 600 volts in series. But notice it's only at 7 amps, and that's why you can use number 14 or number 12 uh, home wiring uh, for wiring up your system. So, what I tell people to do add two diodes and a switch, and when the uh, when the grid goes down, close that switch, and that puts this in parallel with this. And now all of a sudden I have 250 to 300 volts DC at 15 amps, which is still 3 kW worth of power. And here's your switch, $6. It's a 60 amp switch at 600 volts. Just a simple AC disconnect from Home Depot. Um, and what you get is 3 kW to power your TV, stereo, internet, charger, blah, 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 blah which is probably adds up to about 400 watts. And yet you've got all this power. What about your well pump, furnace blower, all that stuff? Everything you need, forget about it. Uh, they don't run on DC. Um, the good news is that you can now buy air conditioning AC heat pumps that they call them variable speed. Variable speed means diode. 330 volts DC. All of your air conditioning and heat pumping is, do, is done at that, and you can come in at 330 volts DC into that part of the circuit, and now you have uh, direct DC high voltage. Um, so anyway, the number one do-it-yourself backup is to find a, a, a set of inverters that can take the 200 to 500 volts DC and give you 60 hertz inverter. And we're not yet there yet because the market is not there yet. The electric car companies, or all the car companies, are not going to let the consumer go find 300 and 400 volts to tap into, and they're not going to add the $300 cost of having a whole house inverter in the car um, because people won't, uh, don't want to pay for it. Uh, but again, only in Japan do we, ha do we have that. But you can still do it yourself just by you know, a couple of car batteries, an inverter, and then you can power the refrigerator and lights, and, uh, and you're done. But here's, here's where I... Here's, how I was able to sneak into this conference <laughs> uh, is beware of solar RFI. Everybody uh, hopes saw uh, K1KP's QST article in April 2016 about the disaster of his solar system where um, 95 dB above the noise floor on HF is, is the primary spur and you, you, you see it replicated every 14 kilohertz plus the noise floor is up by what, 25 dB um, above the noise floor. So forget HF. Uh, if you're using uh, what are called optimizers, those are a disaster, and the FCC is not doing anything about it. This is what that noise floor, right across this red line here, looks like at night when the sun goes down. So here's another one. Uh, the Coast Guard has put out this marine safety alert. They, they found people calling mayday, 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 and the ground, uh, the shore stations call back and the boats never hear them because the boats have 20 to 30 dB of increased noise floor due to LED lighting. All right. Now, not, ev not every LED does this, just bad ones do. Okay. So they have these procedures to tell people how to tell whether you have uh, any interference or not. And they say, turn off your LED lights, set your squelch, turn on the LED lights, and if you hear noise, then you've got a problem. Does anybody know of a problem with that? Federally published procedure for life and death? Well, no. When you set the squelch, a squelch is a noise squelch. Noise will keep the squelch closed. And it took me a while to realize that. And that is, if you take your noise squelch and you see zero dB on your signal strength meter, right, in your FM radio, FM mobile, open the squelch, and now all of a sudden you see signal strength. You hear noise, but you, you know, that's what you expect to hear on FM. But that's showing you that when you set the squelch, the signal strength bar goes away because it, it would be distracting to you. But you might have 20 or 30 dB of noise floor, and you don't know it. And I found that out the hard way by just driving around thinking everything is fine, but knowing that I cannot hear repeaters as well as some other people do uh, in one of my conversions. And I finally realized that, you know, this, uh, until you open the squelch, you're not even seeing the signal strength uh, bars. Um, so uh, I've written to the uh, Coast Guard and saying, you're killing people. 
people do this test and think they don't have any noise, and it's totally hidden from them, and they've ignored me. Um, so anyway, this is what the optimizers, these solar edge optimizers that mount on the back of every uh, panel, uh, normally they just put them in series and bring it back, and, and there, what do you have? You have a nice RF loop that's generating RFI all over the neighborhood. Uh, the fix is to take all those panels off, turn it into twisted pair, put chokes between every one of them. This is only half, the, this is only one third of the fix. This is the 240 volt AC line, or excuse me, for optimizer, it's a DC line, but it has all this trash hash because every one of these things is a DC to DC converter uh, with apparently no attention whatsoever to part 15. And, uh, but then you have to, let's see if it's the next, no, then... Then in addition to that, you've got to go put these things between the solar panel and the micro uh, and the optimizer. So you've you've got a major investment in uh, chokes. And then uh, the guy who wrote that article says he can. It's somewhat tar tolerable. He still has huge noise uh, floor, but it's it, it's uh, tolerable. But here's the thing: you might not be going solar, but what about your neighbor? Talk to your neighbor now. Find out what he's going to do. And do not, under any circumstances, let him buy solar edge optimizers. It'll, it'll, you'll ruin your hobby forever. Uh, so if you uh, talk to your neighbor now, if you wait until you hear it, it's too late. Uh, you've lost your HF hobby during the daytime forever. Now here's a slide that I, I stumbled across. It takes all the air on Earth and puts it in one little sphere. It takes all the water on the Earth puts it in the sphere, takes all the fresh water, puts it into that tiny sphere. People think we have a lot of air, we have a lot of water, and I could just dump stuff into it. But when you put it all into a little sphere, you realize, well, whoops, we're, uh, we're all trying to share that. And of course, um, there's only one spectrum, RF spectrum, in your neighborhood, and uh, if somebody's polluting that, you've got to move. Anyway, the average American home uses about four... Uh, tons of coal-fired uh, electricity per year, and look what we're doing to West Virginia. Uh, people talk about, you know, mining for coal, uh, mining for oil, and they say, but now all we're going to do is mine for lithium, and mining for lithium is as easy as driving around a pickup truck, scraping up a bunch of salt in this 10,000 square mile uh, kilometer um, salt flat, and uh, taking the lithium out of that. Here's the slide. The Nash, uh, national energy consumption. These are all the sources from solar, natural gas, coal, and petroleum. These are the things that use it. Residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. This is all the wasted heat. This is the energy that actually is used, it does useful work based on all these uh, sources. Now I'm going to concentrate on people look at the uh, uh, renewables and say, geez, take out nuclear, uh, and it's a, pit, it's a pittance. So, you know, we're never going to solve this problem. Um, there's the problem, all of our uh, energy that comes from uh, fossil fuels. But all that energy that comes from fossil fuels, is, is you'll look where it all goes, 80% uh, of it goes to wasted heat, wasted emissions, just stuff we simply do not need to be doing. And let's look down here at all of the, the biggest one, look at all this petroleum that we're burning to get that much actual movement of the car down the road. And that's why I've redrawn it. Let's take all of these things and take out nuclear. Let's take the solar, the hydro, the wind that we've got now, and looky there. We could provide all of the transportation uh, that we currently use without any emissions. So, uh, and you say, well, you know, that's for somebody else to do. No, the purpose of this is to say, you don't go out and just do it because I say so. Um, every two years, on average, we face a major energy decision, whether it's a roof, a HVAC, a job, a uh, move or retirement, a water heater, car, a lawnmower, energy choice from the utility. Uh, we're always faced with these, what, my water heater broke, what do I do? Don't go buy another um, non-heat pump water heater. Um, that's where all our energy goes. I need to speed up. This slide shows it, I showed it earlier, but I cheated a little bit. I said uh, nine solar panels would fully charge the Prius plug-in and the hybrid Pacifica and most of those other 27 uh, plug-in hybrids every day forever. But if you are the standard American who drives 40 miles a day, then you need 12 solar panels. 
So 12 solar panels can, this is not 12, it's just the best picture I could find. 12 solar panels can fully charge the average American's transportation needs forever. Never going to a gas station, never having to worry about foreign oil or, or wars and all that stuff. Okay, so if you want to do something, the first thing to do is sign up with your utility for wind. These are all the states that allow you to have deregulation, and you just call your power company and say, I want to sign up for wind. Um, LED lighting, uh, it, when I started giving this talk uh, two years, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was only one in four households were doing it. Now I think most people are, are using LEDs. And, and the cost of bulbs in my area, are, are, uh, this used to be uh, under $2 a watt. They're down to about a dollar, uh, excuse me, a dollar per bulb. Uh, at Home Depot, but that's a subsidized cost by the keep Maryland green kind of thing. I don't know what it is. It probably it's two dollars a bulb now, most places. Um, but here's the here's the number one thing, and that is all these little gas engines that we drive are ten times more polluting than a modern gas car with a catalytic converter. And so, just mowing your uh, grass once a week for an hour is the same thing as, it turns out, 11 days of one hour commuting as far as emissions and, excuse me, as, as far as toxins uh, in the atmosphere. The other thing I like about the electric lawnmower is there's nothing to spill, so it only takes up about one square foot in the garage. Uh, so the next easiest thing to do is to uh, buy a plug-in car. Uh, and this one is a uh, switch to a heat pump. And you say, well, I've got... Uh, I've already got a fossil fuel. Keep that, you know, uh, or people will say, I've gone out and got an estimate, and they want $30,000 to replace all the ducts in my house. Forget about it. Um, let me see what my next slide is. Um, you can go heat pump by just putting in, instead of a uh, window air conditioner, put in a, a heat pump uh, air conditioner, uh, put in a, a, a portable uh, air conditioner heat pump, or do one of these mini split units. They're only 600 bucks. You still have to have a professional install it for a lot more. But you put this anywhere in the house and put this outside, and now you have heat pump energy. Keep your existing fossil fuel heating system. It works. It's great. You need it on the coldest days. But why are you paying two to three times a, a per BTU when you could be using the electricity uh, uh, three times more efficiently? And, of course, replace a water heater with a heat pump water heater because you can get three times the uh, uh, he, uh, water uh, from that compared to uh, a straight electric. Uh, these are the mini splits. They're sold everywhere. Uh, you put them anywhere in the room and you have an outside unit. Now you can have up to four of these inside units at various places in the outside unit. No duct, duct work, just a three inch hole to get those little uh, copper uh, pipes out. I think I'm gonna make it, by the way, uh, the time limit there. They're having panics in the back. Um, so here, never buy or replace an air conditioning unit again. Replace it with a bi-directional heat pump. It only costs about 10% more, but it cools, it dehumidifies, and it heats at one-third the cost of electricity or one-half the cost of oil or propane. You can even buy a, uh, a mini-split heat pump that can run directly on solar. Why? Because you can already buy a mini-split a mini that has the, um, what do I call it, variable speed. If it's variable speed, internally it's running on DC. If it's internally running on DC, you can hook solar panels up to it. Yeah, question. Well, that's why you always have a backup heat source. So that's why you always keep your fossil fuel for those coldest nights and everything else. But you run the heat pumps whenever they can do the job uh, efficiently. And that's heat that you're not paying uh, two to three times for when you don't need it. So finish this sentence. Uh, there's nothing certain in life, death and taxes and utilities. But you can do something about these. You can save 30% on your taxes and eliminate 100% of your utilities for the rest of your life. A lot of people think that, well, I have to have a south uh, uh, roof. No, even if you're pointing east, you still get 85% because with grid-tie solar, the only thing that matters is your total production over the year, not what you get on the worst day in December. Where you, on the worst day in December, you're not going to get very much power there. doesn't matter. You made twice as much power during the summer. Okay, so um, the advantage of an east, though, is that you have, usually have two roofs that you can put solar panels on, which instead of 85% for one, you now can generate 170% of the energy that the ideal south-facing roof. So forget about which direction your house faces. As long as the sun shines on it, you've got all of the energy you need. Even, even facing south, if you put up your own solar, set, uh, uh, the solar panels on the north will do nothing in the winter, 
but during the summer they're equal to the south array and during the summer it's twice as long you get twice as much energy so uh, these will produce 60 percent annually what these do but if you do it yourself and you install that at one-fifth the cost of a contractor you're making money so uh, tilt same thing doesn't matter whether it's uh, 20 degrees all the way up to 50 degrees tilt the output, annual output, is only 1% difference. So that's why you never see these erector sets anymore with solar panels. They just put them on any available surface because it's hardly any difference whatsoever. Just get it in the sun. Uh, of course, the biggest problems with solar is shade. But, you know, shade is not always a good thing. Um, but it's also the easiest to fix. So uh, a chainsaw fixes a lot. Uh, chop down the tree that's preventing you from solar and plant the tree where you want it. One solar panel is worth eight fully mature trees as far as uh, reducing our carbon emissions. 10% um, return on your investment for life. I used to use this slide, but I've got a better one now. Um, I'm now ten, I've been giving this talk now for almost 10 years, and so I've go, I'm coming back around to all the, anybody that listened to me, ham clubs in our area, and I asked people to raise their hand. I said, how many people went solar since I was last here? One or two people raised their hands. And, um, and so my point is, you didn't do anything about it. If you have a $100 a month electric bill, you have thrown $11,000 of your own money to the uh, utility. What do you have to show for it? Nothing. Uh, you've missed out on the $3,000 uh, federal tax uh, credit. You missed out on the $2,000 in local credit. You've just thrown away $15,000 compared to that guy who, who took, that, uh, uh, took that money and, uh, and put up solar. This is the gold slide. And I hope I finished. Let's say you have $12,000 in savings, but you have this hole in the bucket, which is $100 a month. You're paying for utilities for the rest of your life. The guy who says, I'm going to keep that in the bank at 1% interest per year. I'm going to pay the $1,200 a, a, a year for utilities. At the end of 10 years, you got nothing. Actually, you've earned $1,200 in interest. So at the end of 11 years, you've got absolutely nothing to show for that $12,000 you put in the bank to save for retirement. Whereas the smart investor says, I'm going to take that $12,000, I'm going to borrow $4,000 from my kids, and I'm going to install a $16,000 array on the roof of my house. I didn't spend that money. I, didn't, I converted that money, which is numbers on a piece of paper in a bank, into equity on the roof of my house. And I own it, and it's mine, and I can see it. I immediately get back $4,000 uh, when you file your taxes, and you give that back to the kids. Uh, you get back uh, $600 a year or so in uh, solar, solar renewable energy credits. You got uh, $1,200 a year of free electricity, got $1,000 from the state. At the, uh, even in day one, you still got your uh, $16,000 worth of equity on the roof of your house. But at the end of 10 years, you've still got the, the system value, the $5,000 tax refunds, uh, the, the money you've earned in solar renewable energy credits. You've got $20,000 in equity, and you've avoided $12,000 in electric bills, so the net value to you is $32,000. So that, or do you want to have nothing at the end of 10 years and keep paying $12,000? Uh, so yeah, that's the gold standard slide. Uh, and don't believe me, talk to your nearest solar representative. So uh, you can do something about it. The best investment ever for retirement uh, is uh, solar panels because you're going to get 8 to 10% return on that investment, and there's nothing uh, that I know of that is as secure as the sun. So uh, now this question comes up. I, I am, I am going to make it, I think. Um, do you buy it or lease it? You don't lease it if you can possibly afford it because the leasing company is going to make all that money. You uh, either borrow uh, and, and build it, and, and get the best deal you can, then you'll save about 25% uh, for your energy uh, amortized over the 20 years. But if you buy it yourself, you're going to uh, save about 50% um, of the total energy. And that's assuming that prices of electricity don't go up. If the prices of electricity go up, uh, you, you'll be uh, getting uh, your solar for about 30, 30 cents on the dollar compared to everybody else. A lot of people say, well, I'm waiting for higher efficiency solar cells. Everybody's heard there are higher efficiency solar cells out there, right? They've been out there since I graduated from college. The price of silicon is down here to 30 cents a watt. The price of the high efficiency solar cells is up now up to $1,000 a watt. Why? Because Lockheed Martin and the space industry will pay anything, millions of dollars, to get one more watt on orbit. 
the homeowner will not pay another dime. And so now we're at the point where to get two times more efficiency, it costs a thousand, actually it's about 2,000 times more to get that efficiency. You are never ever going to see high efficiency solar cells ever be able to do this cost curve like this because the Lockheed Martins will just keep throwing money at it and last year's model has no market. Okay, so anyway, uh, a lot of people said back in 2008, I loved it, uh, the grid cannot handle more than 2% solar, it'll go unstable and it'll be the end of the world. Okay, by 2013, Hawaii had hit 40%, Germany had hit 60%, by 2014, Netherlands and Spain had hit 100% uh, renewables for a day. Um, by 20, uh, in 2015, and everybody says, yeah, but what about China? Well, what about China? In 2015, they installed more solar in one year than the USA had to date. And they're, they're still beating us hand over foot. Uh, Saudi Arabia now is uh, completely invested in solar because it's cheaper. Than, I should have said oil. Um, Oil-rich Texas in 2017, uh, just two years ago, hit 100% uh, all of their energy coming from uh, renewables. Um, Denmark now is at 60% solar and wind for the entire year. Uh, I don't know what I was going to say there, but now uh, hitting 100% is very common. Now, the problem is we are all do-it-yourself persons, and the problem is, is that you cannot do solar grid tie yourself because you have to have the building permit, the electrical permit, the building inspection, the electrical inspection, the utility inspection, before they're going to give you a net meter. And if you don't have a net meter, you got nothing because you got nowhere to put that energy. But anybody can go out and buy a $100 grid tie inverter, plug it into the wall, and hook up a solar panel to it. Okay? But don't do it. You can do it with one panel. Because what happens when you're not there, the refrigerator ticks off, it's the spring or in the fall, the kids aren't home, the lights are off, your house might only be using one panel's worth of electricity. Anything you else you generate, if you plugged in two panels, you're going to push your meter backward, There's nothing wrong with that, except that every meter except the net meter is going to charge you going that way and charge you coming this way. So now your solar investment is working against you. So the only way to do uh, uh, the, the solution is this. Contract for a small system, maybe uh, at, at $2.50 a watt. So if you've got a 2 kW system, if you could find a solar, manu uh, solar installer to do that, you might pay $5,000 for that system. But you get all of that legality for, for, for that price. Then you can come back and add panels all you want for $0.30 cents a watt and these plug-in inverters at about $0.30 cents a watt. So you're able to expand your system for about $0.60 cents a watt or about one-fourth what the... Uh, um, contractor does. So anyway, the other tip is that if you already have an inverter and you already have solar panels facing, say, uh, southwest, it's, you can install additional uh, solar panels about 90 degrees away, especially if there's some trees in the middle, such that when these start losing sun, these start losing, uh, gaining sun, and now you get twice the kilowatt hours per day, and, but you did not have to buy another inverter. And that's what I did with my house when I had to double up because I switched to a heat pump. I just started, most of my uh, arrays were initially southeast because that's where the most sun was. So now I started adding it on the southwest and the northwest and everywhere else. And so I got to keep all the same inverters and only had to pay for the solar panels, which if you buy from the truckload uh, down in Miami, you can get for 25 cents a watt. Okay, I'm almost done. So um, this is just saying uh, switch to a heat pump. Um, I already said that. Oh, and a lot of people say, well, what about you know, solar hot water heating? It was dead in 2008, and now you'll see articles that say it's dead, 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 dead. It makes absolutely no sense. It's a maintenance uh, nightmare and everything else. It's only about 75% efficient, and only if you use every single drop of uh, hot water every day. If you don't use every single drop of hot water every day, you have got a system that's not generating anything that day because the tank is already warm. Um, the, the solution is uh, solar panels are now 10 times cheaper and uh, uh, heat pump hot water heaters are now three times more efficient. So this is now 30 times better than it used to be. And so it has equal, easily equaled parity with the provision that here you have to use 100% of your hot water every day or you're losing money. Here 
If you don't take a shower, you just made 15 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity that you put into the grid that you can use later. Go on a vacation, you're still producing, you're still getting all the net benefit. So anyway, uh, move forward with solar energy. There's always something you can do. Look for those opportunities and watch out for RFI. And I'm done. Ta-da!